Thank you for downloading episode 47 of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. This is the second and final part of Who Killed Freddie Mills? So if you haven't, listen to episode 46 first. But before we begin, please take a moment to listen to this important message. Ho, ho, ho! It's not quite almost sort of Christmas-ish. Ho, ho, ho! A festive time of wildly confusing pagan and Christian rituals. But mostly, it's about gorging on food, family arguments, watching a Bond film, and spending lots of money. Ho, ho, ho! So if your house is like this... Daddy, for Christmas, I want a Murder Mile mug. Oh, really? And have you tidied your bedroom? No? We're going fucking tidy it then! <laughs> Honey, for Christmas, what I really want is... Please say divorce, please say divorce, please say divorce. A Murder Mile card with badges and stickers. Ah, shit. Son, what I want is... Please say it, please say it, please say it. A lovely one-way trip to Switzerland. Yes, hallelujah! But first, I want a voice cameo in a Murder Mile episode. You got it, Granny. Why not treat your loved ones to a Murder Mile ebook? It's a good distraction as you bash them over the head. Give vouchers to a Murder Mile walk? If they're really obnoxious, I'll bump them off for you. A Murder Mile ringtone? If you've forgotten where you've buried the body, just call. And a whole episode dedicated just to them. Think of it as an early obituary. And by loved ones, I really mean yourself. Sod the family, they're all a bunch of ungrateful bastards. Ho ho ho! Murder Mile in no way endorses the brutal death of family members. Unless a murder is committed in or near Soho, that it's grisly, shocking and amusing, and you give me exclusive rights to all the photos, interviews and murder weapons so I can make an episode out of it. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Murder Mile. A true crime podcast, an audio-guided walk, featuring many of London's untold, unsolved and long-forgotten murders, all set within one square mile of London's West End. Today's episode is part two about the mysterious death of Freddie Mills. Was it a suicide or a murder involving debts, threats, depression, a bungled investigation, a secret sexuality, or was he a sadistic serial killer with a guilty conscience? Murder Mile is researched using the original police files. It contains moments of satire, shock, and grisly details. And as a dramatization of real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds, so that no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 47, Who Killed Freddie Mills? Part 2. In the early hours of Sunday the 25th of July 1965, in the darkest corner of Gosford Yard, an eerily silent dead end just off Charingcross Road, Freddie Mills, the champion boxer, wholesome celebrity and beloved family man, was found dead. There were no gunshots heard, no fingerprints found, no threats on his life, no witnesses, no suspects, and exactly how, when and why he was shot is unknown. The crime scene was simple. Freddy had sat alone in the left rear seat of his own silver Citroen DS19 for one and a half hours to sleep off a raging headache and the alcohol he had consumed. Its engine was off, its lights were out, the rear windows were open and the car was in complete darkness. And having suffered from insomnia, depression and being crippled by escalating debts, Using a .22 caliber rifle, Freddy shot himself in the head. 
the gun was found in his car, the bullets matched the gun, and with the coroner ruling his death as a suicide, eight days later, the case was closed. But several elements of the case just didn't make any sense. According to those who knew him and loved him, not only was Freddy a fighter, a winner and a champion, who rolled with the punches and always got up when he was knocked down, but as a loving father and doting husband who was full of life, fun and love, who loved his family above everything else. If he did kill himself in a fit of depression, why was there no suicide note? These are the elements that are in question. If he had been drinking, where was the bottle? If this was Freddy's car, why was he sat in the left rear seat? If this was the gun that had killed Freddy, where did it come from? Who owned it? Why was it found neatly propped against the seat in front? And why was he shot using a fairground rifle? If he had shot himself, why was he sitting upright with both hands flat on his lap? And why had he been shot in the right eye? And more bafflingly, why did the police delay investigating the crime scene for several hours? And why was the body of Freddie Mills and the rifle itself removed before the police had even arrived? After his death, several theories started circulating, suggesting that Freddy had a dark side. Five deep secrets that for many years he had kept hidden from his friends, family and legion of fans, which linked him to deaths, gangsters, police corruption, a secret life as a bisexual and a sadistic past as the depraved slayer of eight women in West London known as the Hammersmith Stripper. What makes each theory stick is the fact that they are all plausible. So let's look at them a little closer. Theory 1. Freddie Mills was murdered by Chinese gangsters who were trying to take over his club. It's true. Freddie was the co-owner of a Soho nightclub with his Chinese business partner, Andy Ho. Two years prior, the Freddie Mills night spot had been a Chinese restaurant, which was situated just one street away from Chinatown, an area ruled by the triads, who during that era were rapidly expanding their criminal empire through extortion, blackmail and murder. But with no threats on Freddy's life, no known association with the triads, and no evidence that the actor, chef, and the club's co-owner, Andy Ho, was himself a triad. If this was a murder, used to force an unwilling businessman to part with his club, why didn't they kill Andy Ho? Why didn't they kill Chrissy, who was also a co-owner? And why would they make this incredibly powerful message looked like a suicide. Theory two, Freddie Mills committed suicide over the death of his gay lover. It's true. Freddie was distraught at the death of his close friend, Michael Holliday, a popular singer with chart hits in the 1950s and the 1960s. And being a fragile man, with drug issues, a history of mental illness, and a secret sexuality. On the 29th of October 1963, having headlined at the Freddie Mills night spot, a cabaret situated in Soho, the homosexual capital of the West End, Michael Holliday tragically overdosed, just two years before the mysterious death of Freddie. But were Freddie and Michael gay lovers? No. Freddy was a big-hearted, happily married man who loved and cared for everyone, who feared for his friend's mental health and had tried 
and failed to prevent Michael's suicide. And although the press tried to paint Freddy as a secret homosexual, who they claimed had been arrested in a public lavatory and charged with indecency, a charge for which there is no evidence, Ronnie Cray, the openly bisexual East End gangster who knew Freddy and dated Michael Holliday, stated before he died, Freddy's a real man's man. He wasn't that way inclined. Theory 3. Freddie Mills was either murdered by, or his suicide was staged by the Cray twins. It's true. Freddie Mills knew the infamous East End gangsters, Ronnie and Reggie Cray, who had a history of violence, regularly frequented his club, both had access to guns, were in London at the time of his death, and in the following years, both Ronnie and Reggie Cray were convicted of murder. So did the Cray twins murder Freddie Mills? No, of course they didn't. Not only was every club in 1960s Soho frequented by gangsters, and not only was Freddie not a threat to them, but as ex-boxers themselves, Ronnie and Reggie Cray were in awe of Freddie and considered it an honour to drink and chat with the former light heavyweight champion of the world, a man they called their friend. Two years after Freddie's death, when his wife Chrissy asked Detective Chief Superintendent Leonard Nipper Reed, the man who made it his mission to bring down the Cray twins, to examine Freddie's case, even he had to reluctantly state that there was no evidence that the Cray twins were ever involved. And besides, the idea that Freddie's death was either a murder or a staged suicide simply doesn't make any sense. As why would Freddie pay someone to stage his suicide or murder? And even if they did, why would they shoot him in the eye using a fairground rifle, and not leave a suicide note. And yet, if you still truly believe that Freddy was murdered, ask yourself this. Why would a hired assassin choose to commit a murder using fake bullets? Yes, fake bullets, which weren't made of lead, they were made of clinker, a stony residue made from burnt coal, which is designed to fragment when it hits a wooden target, just like it would at a fun fair. Theory 4 The police deliberately bungled the investigation into the death of Freddie Mills. It's true. The police delayed a full examination of Gosselet Yard for several hours, and the body of Freddie Mills and the rifle itself was removed from the crime scene before the police had even arrived. But the investigation was bungled. When the ambulance drivers, Leslie Rowe and Thomas Spaulding, arrived at 1.39am, the alley was so dark they had to use torches, as did the police, who preserved the scene by sealing off the street and didn't conduct a thorough examination of Gosselet Yard or the car until after sunrise at 4.31am. And why was Freddy's body removed from the scene? Simple, because he wasn't dead. Having been shot some time prior to 11.45pm, although Freddy was motionless, unresponsive and bleeding, having detected very faint signs of life, Rowan Spaulding, the ambulance drivers, transferred Freddy to Middlesex Hospital and they took charge of the rifle so the doctor could examine what type of gun and bullet his patient had been shot with all of which was standard practice for a suicide. And theory five. 
Freddie Mills, was an infamous serial killer known as the Hammersmith Stripper. It's true. Between 1959 and 1965, in West London, eight young prostitutes were strangled by a serial sexual sadist who dumped their naked bodies in or around the River Thames. And according to Chief Superintendent John DeRose, who headed up the investigation, his prime suspect was a respectable married man and an ex-boxer in his 40s who had committed suicide in mid-1965. Even Michael Litchfield, reporter for the tabloid newspaper The Sun, confirmed that Mills had met with John DeRose, a fellow Freemason at the West End's Masonic Lodge, and that Freddie had confessed to the murders in return for a reduced sentence. A devastating confession which DeRose secretly recorded. So was Freddie Mills, the world champion boxer, the beloved film star and the devout family man, secretly the brutal slayer of eight prostitutes in the 1960s who was known as the Hammersmith Stripper. No, of course he wasn't. This theory, like all of those we've just discussed, is complete and utter dog shit. And here's why. Freddy was not a sexual sadist with a hatred for women. He was never cruel, mean or spiteful. He was a good man with a big heart who above everything else loved his family. Freddie had no criminal record. Not one charge for assault, indecency, soliciting, harassment, peeping, prowling or public lewdness. All of which you would expect from a serial sexual sadist. Of the 7,000 men who were interviewed by the police in connection with the Hammersmith stripper, whose cars were seen curb crawling in the area, a silver Citroen with the license plate DLR610 does not appear in the police database and Freddie Mills was never questioned. Freddie does not match the identikit of the police's primary suspect who was a short, slim, elfin-faced youth with a long straight nose, beady little eyes and sticky out ears. And even if you exclude the fact that Chief Superintendent John DeRose confirmed that Freddie Mills was never a suspect at any point in any part of the investigation into the Hammersmith stripper. This taped conversation, which Michael Litchfield claims exists, has never been seen, has never been heard, and even in John DeRose's own autobiography, it was never once mentioned or referenced. So how did this theory begin? It began with a simple misunderstanding. Chief Superintendent John DeRose stated that his prime suspect in the investigation was a respectable married man and an ex-boxer in his 40s who had committed suicide in mid-1965. A description which perfectly fits Freddie Mills and his very public death, which across Britain was front page news. Only DeRose wasn't talking about Freddie at all. He was talking about Mungo Island. A mid-40s ex-boxer and happily married man who worked as a security guard on the Heron Trading Estate in Acton, an area synonymous with prostitution and where the body of the Hammersmith stripper's last victim was found and having become the police's prime suspect in the murders. Mungo Island left a note which read, I can't stick it any longer. To save you and the police looking for me, I'll be in the garage. Where his dead body was found, 
having guessed himself. So if Freddy wasn't murdered by the Triads, if his death wasn't staged by the Cray Twins, if the police investigation wasn't part of a Masonic cover-up, and if he wasn't a sadistic serial killer with a guilty conscience, was he really just a former boxing idol, a fading film star, and a failing businessman who was racked with debts and in a booze fueled fit of depression took his own life? What really happened that night? To understand Freddy's death, we have to go back to 1948, when he was at the peak of his success. On the 26th of July, 1948, Fearless Freddy fought the American boxer Gus Lesnovich in front of a 46,000 strong crowd in West London's White City Stadium. And although Freddy wasn't a skilled fighter, with a dogged mix of pressure, persistence, and an uncanny ability to take a pounding. As Lesnovich launched a brutal attack in the 12th and 13th rounds, Freddy went the distance and won on points to become the world light heavyweight champion, a national hero, and one of Britain's greatest boxing idols. Freddy was at the top of his game, with nowhere to go, but down. Two months later, Freddy was set to defend his title against Lesnovich, but the fight was cancelled, as having been diagnosed with a misaligned vertebrae at the base of his skull, Freddy was crippled with migraines and dizziness, symptoms which would plague him for the rest of his life. In November 1948, Freddy beat Johnny Ralph in Johannesburg for the Empire Heavyweight title, breaking a metacarpal in his right hand. In June 1949, Freddy fought Bruce Woodcock to retain the British, Empire and European title, but was floored four times and knocked out in the 14th round. And in January 1950, having lost three teeth and with his gums embedded in his upper jaw, Fearless Freddy lost the World Light Heavyweight title to Joey Maxim, who knocked him out in the 10th round. One month later, Freddie Mills retired from boxing. Making full use of his celebrity status, being blessed with a cheeky smile, twinkling eyes and a childish sense of fun, Fearless Freddie made the move into television and quickly became a family favourite. But as the 50s made way for the 60s, and his crippling migraines started affecting his memory, his speech, and had developed into facial tics. Acting work for Freddie Mills had begun to dry up. But Freddie was no dummy. He knew his career as a boxer and an actor was short-lived. So being eager to provide a stable future for his beloved family, Freddie had invested his winnings in several properties and businesses in and around London. In 1946, four years before his retirement from boxing, Freddie and his friend Andy Ho opened the Freddie Mills Chinese restaurant at 143 Charing Cross Road, where, having wisely used his celebrity status to pull in the punters, it remained as a profitable and popular business for almost 20 years. And although, in the 1940s, Chinese restaurants were a rarity, by the 1960s, they were commonplace. So being eager to regain his success, in May 1963, Freddie invested 12,000 pounds, which is a quarter of a million pounds today, and converted his Chinese restaurant into a cabaret and a nightclub called the Freddie Mills Night Spot, which was instantly a success for four months, and then it closed. 
faced with tough competition, spiraling overheads, and with Freddie's celebrity status almost non-existent. As the nightclub sunk deeper into debt, Freddie was forced to sell off his other properties, simply to stay afloat. And although, in September 1963, the Freddie Mills night spot was up for sale, no one would buy it. Being a born fighter, with an uncanny ability to take a pounding, Freddie reopened the night spot in August 1964. But again, the club struggled, and Freddie was taken to court for non-payment of bills. And then, being crippled by migraines, dizziness, and bedridden with pneumonia, on Friday the 23rd of July 1965, just two days before his death, Freddie and Andy Ho were found guilty of keeping an illegal fruit machine and fined £68. With his finances laid bare before the court, it was only then that Chrissy, his wife, learned how dire their situation was. That Freddie Mills, the world champion boxer, actor, businessman, devoted father and loyal husband, was broke. With his cheeky smile and that infamous twinkle in his eye now gone, as he secretly struggled to cope with depression, having been trained as a boxer never to show any weakness, Freddie fought on. And although never once in Freddie's life had he ever given up, here he had reached rock bottom. On Tuesday the 20th of July 1965, Freddie drove to the home of 58-year-old Mary Gladys Ronaldson, an old friend from his fledgling days as a semi-professional pugilist at Sam McEwen's boxing booth, who was currently working at the nearby Battersea Funfair. Under the pretense that he had been hired to open a charity fete in Isha that weekend, and that he wanted to dress as a cowboy, he asked Mary for a gun. The gun she offered him was an FN self-loading .22 caliber Belgian repeater rifle. The type used to shoot targets at a funfair. She had no issues loaning him the gun. She knew Freddy, she trusted him, and with the unloaded rifle having been removed from the shooting gallery as it was old, faulty, and prone to misfire, she knew it would be perfect as a prop and harmless as a lethal weapon. With no other option, unable to confide in his friends, too ashamed to tell his family, and knowing that most gangsters are gossips, Freddy accepted her offer. And after he had left, although the faulty rifle was unloaded, of the five bullets that her son had left on the mantelpiece, Three were now missing. Exactly what happened that night, only Freddy knows. But the most logical theory is this. On the evening of Saturday the 24th of July 1965, the night that Freddy was shot, being gripped with depression, a migraine, pneumonia and chronic insomnia. Having kissed his beloved wife and daughters goodbye, Freddie hopped into his silver Citroen DS19 and drove to Gosford Yard. Freddie was a champion, a fighter and a winner who had achieved greatness and to many he was an idol who once had it all. But now, it was gone. His fame, his health, and his wealth. Being trained to hide his weakness, Freddy sat alone in the darkness of his car, a loaded rifle in his hands, barely a few feet from an off-license, a pub, and the half-empty nightclub, which every second it stayed open, it bled him dry. 
as with just £387 to his name, within the week he would be bankrupt. And to the family, who he truly adored, with his life insured, Freddy knew he was better off dead. Freddy was a man torn, as having returned the gun once before, written no suicide note, and yet he had made plans to compare the cabaret and to meet Chrissy and Don. For almost an hour, he sat alone, mulling over his life, with alcohol in his blood, a throbbing pain in his brain, and tears in his eyes. Having test fired the rifle, and seeing the dense clinker almost penetrate the steel base of the passenger side door, as the faulty rifle worked fine, and seeing no other way out, closing his eyes tight, fearless Freddy put the muzzle of the rifle to his forehead. No one would see anything, as the car was hidden in a dark dead end. No one would hear anything, as the fairground rifle wouldn't make a bang, but a muffled pop. And with the crime scene being a chaotic mess of distressed relatives and friends, all concerned for Freddy, who wasn't dead, but dying, it's clear to see how, where and why the confusion began. So who moved Freddy and sat him upright with his hands on his lap? Well, before the ambulance men arrived, four people clearly stated that they moved Freddy. Robert Deacon, the doorman, shook him. Mr Mills, it's time. Henry Grant, the head waiter, shook and slapped him. Freddy, wake up! Chrissy had hugged and cradled him. Freddy, Freddy! his blood staining her blouse, as did his stepson, Don. And for at least an hour and a half after he was shot, Freddy wasn't dead. So who moved the rifle, and where were the fingerprints? Well, according to the police, as guns are oily, Usable fingerprints are only recovered in less than 5% of all cases. And again, in their own witness statements, three people admitted to moving the gun. Leslie Rowe and Thomas Spaulding, the ambulance men, and Freddie's own stepson, Don, who stated, I'm certain that I put it back in roughly the same place. So why was Freddie shot in the eye? Well, it's entirely possible that the faulty gun didn't go off. That he only opened his eyes to wonder why he wasn't dead. That he only moved the gun from his forehead to see what was wrong. And with the rifle being prone to misfire, a light thud may have dislodged the firing pin, accidentally shooting a lethal blast of clinker into his eye and deep into his brain. Although, what really happened that night, only Freddy truly knows. Freddy Mills was a good man. He wasn't a gangster, a secret homosexual, or a serial sexual sadist. He was a devoted family man with a cheeky smile, twinkling eyes, and a big heart, who struggled alone with injury, debt, and depression. And for the final time, he lost the brave fight. And although a series of shallow, self-serving cowards have fabricated a series of scandalous tales and rumours simply to make themselves a name, some cash, or to boost their ratings, Fearless Freddy did not deserve to be treated this way. So let us remember him properly. Here's to Freddie Mills, the world light heavyweight champion boxer film star, businessman, loving husband, doting father, and legend.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. And don't forget to tune in next week for the start of Murder Mile's huge eight-part series into the untold story of one of Britain's most terrifying serial killers. Who is it? Find out next week. And if you're a murky miler, stay tuned for more Extra Mile goodies after the break. But before that, here's my recommended podcasts of the week, which are Obscura and Asian Madness. Welcome, listener. I'm glad you're here. This is Justin, the host of Obscura, a true crime podcast. If you enjoy single narrator true crime podcasts with a focus on less covered cases and unflinching detail, then Obscura may be for you. But don't take my word for it. Obscura can be found on your favorite podcast app. There's a good chance that you, yeah, you, are interested in true crime and all things creepy and weird. If I'm right, then there's also a good chance you might find my podcast, the Asian Madness Podcast, interesting. You can find me on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and pretty much everywhere else. It's true crime, it's dark, it's morbid, and it's weird. Come explore the dark side of Asia with me, because let's face it, Asia is just as crazy as the rest of the world. A huge thank you goes out to my new Patreon supporters, some of whom will get to find out who my new multi-part series is about, days before everyone else. Ooh. So thank you to MJ Massadini and Hannah Merza, and of course to Thomas Wiedemann, who donated online to save Murder Mile from poverty. So to each of you folks, thank you so much. You are truly amazing. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Folks, how you diddling? It's extra mile time. Hope you're all well. Hope you've all had a good week. Hope you're not all uh, icy cold like I am. Very cold at the moment. Uh, starting to just about starting to dip into the uh, the lows, into the uh, frozen uh, area. Oh, that didn't even make sense, did it? Uh, it's starting to get cold here. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, but um, just to say, uh, if you're new to Extra Mile, this is Extra Mile. Uh, this is the extra part of the show that I put at the end. Uh, this is where we dig deep into the case we've just dived into, uh, we've just heard about, because it's part two i can actually go through a lot more details on this one because obviously with part one i couldn't say a lot because i didn't want to spoil too much um but this is extra mild so it's all unscripted all unedited there's no music there's no sound effects this is just me waffling uh, as always i'm sitting here uh, i'm waiting for my tea to brew you can hear it in the background buzzing away not buzzing away kettles don't buzz do that's stupid um i don't have a cake today i know uh, normally I, I enjoy a cake while we're doing extra mile. That's my little treat to myself, but I haven't got one. But I will be getting one soon. I'm moored up. Um, for those who don't know, I live on a, a canal boat and I move every week to two weeks. And I'm moored up in a very nice part of northeast London-ish. In a very, very uh, orthodox Jewish area. It's it's a place I've moored up before. It's really nice. It's really I like mooring up there. You feel very safe as well. Because uh, 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 the Orthodox Jews have their own police force, their own kind of police, which is fantastic, and they do a great job as well. Um, but the great thing about this area is, is they have really good bakeries as well. So if, like me, you like bagels, like great to go. Um, it's very funny being here because, like, I would say at least ninety. 95% of the people in this area are Orthodox Jews or, or Russian Orthodox. So everyone's you know, very similarly dressed except for me. And I kind of stick out like a sore thumb. Um, but the bakery is really good. 
I'm gonna pop there in a second and they do big Belgian buns. Really big Belgian buns with so uh, like a swirly pastry with icing on the top and a glacé cherry. But inside they put, oh, my kettle's about to go. You're gonna, you're gonna have to, uh, you're gonna have to, oh, you're gonna have to wonder what I was gonna say. What do they put in the middle of that Belgian bun? Oh, can you wait? I bet some of you are fast forwarding this bit to find out what they put in the middle of the Belgian bun. Is it money? Is it gold? Is it cocaine? Oh, I wish it was cocaine. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Do they put an Aston Martin in the middle of it? Do they put jam? Hey, that's a good one. Never thought of that. Belgian bun, jam in the middle. That's pretty genius, actually. Or maybe chocolate. No, what they do is they put cinnamon. And it's really nice. It's really nice. You kind of have a... Ducks going past. There you go. No, geese, sorry, Canadian geese. Eh? Um, so, yeah, no, so I'm gonna, uh, so as soon as I finish this, I'm gonna head off to the bakery, do that, um, and uh, yeah, then start editing this. Oh, tea's hot. So, uh, a toast to you all. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who's shopped at the Murder Mile shop. There are many of you probably now listening to. Uh, murder mile and extra mile with your extra uh, with your uh, murder mile mug so i'm raising you my murder mile mug as well so cheers i hope you enjoy the your, your bickies and your tea that goes with it as well you can buy them online good there's a little link in the show notes on there now is uh the murder mile mug uh full of goodies which everyone's been buying uh so uh thank you to everyone you can get a mur- official murder mile cards um, if it's for someone's birthday or whatever, there's a little note section in there, as as people have just done recently. So there's a little note section in there. If it's for a, a, a loved one, just leave me a little note and I will write the card to them. Uh, or, or you can leave the note blank. Ebooks are available on there, ebooks one and two. Uh, if you go to the uh, Murder Mile Facebook discussion group, uh, I each week I try and give away a couple of ebooks to everyone. So there's, there's, there's goodies online and there's some other interesting gifts as well. Uh, but before we dive into Extra Mile, I just wanted to say a couple of thank yous. Uh, so I mentioned this last week, but uh, I didn't actually get the parcel by the time I started recording. Because uh, these episodes are recorded like two weeks in advance. So uh, another big thank you to Lisa Lebo, who very kindly sent me loads and loads of gifts. And I'm actually sitting here right now recording these episodes wearing some really, really lovely posh fleece pyjamas, uh, big woolly hat, gloves thermal socks uh i've eaten all the chocolates um <laughs> i know i'm a big piggy and loads of really nice goodies so thank you so much to lisa uh thank you to uh lorraine ledwell uh for coming on on my tour very recently with her sister bringing chockies and we we had a pint afterwards which was really lovely so thank you lorraine uh lorraine and carol see I'm very good at my memory is quite good and on that tour i also get got to meet birthday boy jimmy ardry so um lovely to meet you jimmy uh two badges jimmy um and uh thanks for uh telling me about chicken <laughs> they're not ducks they're chicken that's probably the worst accent ever but i tried my best uh, uh also a thank you to kim nixon um kim has sent me a message saying that she's sending me a box it hasn't arrived yet by the time i'm recording this because I record way in it, uh, ahead, but she sent me a box of gifts, so thank you to Kim. I'll probably put a thank you in the next episode as well. Uh, and also thank you just to everyone who's shopped at Murder Mile Shop. Really much, very much appreciated. There's loads of g- gifts in there for Christmas. Um, I've also put in there, uh, you can get a personal uh, da, 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 a, a message from me, uh, either a video message, I don't know if I've put that one up, or, or a voice message, or you can have a cameo in a murder mile episode it'll only be a little cameo it'll only be like a you know a a, couple, a line or something but if 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 you know someone who would be interested in that you can order those online uh so freddie mills this was going to be my episode 40 um well obviously i pulled oh that was a little burp then i pulled out that episode um only because the bit uh my friend aaron let me finish let me finish let me finish that's aaron um Erin informed me that BBC had done a documentary called Murder in Soho, The Death of Freddie Mills. And that was, I just finished writing this episode. It was a one, only originally a one-parter. So I watched it 
uh, the BBC had really balls it up. It really is. Have a, I'll put a link to it. Um, they're normally good with their documentaries, but it, it, I, I guess they just rushed into it. Or it was a bit of a hodgepodge. So they hadn't really done their research properly. They'd got a pathologist in there to go. Oh, I'm a pathologist, and this is what I believe. And you're meant to go. Oh, he's a pathologist. Look at all the look at all the initials after his name. He must be know what he's talking about. But he missed really, really big, important things. They put some posh graphics in there. They put loads of archive footage. So you meant to go. Oh, this looks great. But they missed all of the really, really, really relevant key pieces of information which were in the archive file, which I know they read because that's where they got the photos from. And I went through the, the, the file itself. And when I watched their documentary, I was just like, you've missed all of the key elements that you're meant to hit on. But what they did was they went to try and do something sensational. Like every other person who's tried to attack this case, they've gone, oh, let's focus on Freddie being the, the Hammersmith stripper. Or let's focus on Freddie being a homosexual. It's like all these things that he wasn't. So what I've tried to do with this case is really just focus on what is the truth... And because we c we will never know 100% because only Freddie knows that and Freddie is dead. What I've tried to do is go very carefully through the case file. Strip away all this sensational rubbish. The kind of shit that most books write or most tabloid newspapers. Which is why, which is why I've said before I don't use newspapers because they're sensational. They're not truth. They're sensational. They're selling you a story. What I'm trying to do is tell you the truth. Trying to put everything into perspective. And when I approached this case, I had no idea about this at all. I didn't know whether this was a murder or a suicide. I didn't know whether Freddie really was a gangster, do you know. But this is months of research. And when you finally piece it together, you're like, well, Freddie can't be a sadist because look at what a lovely man he was. Do you know, unless he was amazingly clever and he could really, really hide every single detail of his of who he was but it's unlikely do you know a really lovely chap really decent family man really strived really hard wasn't a great businessman do you know but he he was always trying to push that a little bit harder and he always as I, I said in here do you know every time he got knocked down he'd get back up again that was Freddie Mills and I just constantly feel very frustrated and annoyed by these people who go for the sensationalist angle and forget that this is a real man this is a real person you know that's what people forget with these when they do documentaries or podcasts or whatever they forget that we're dealing with a real person here a real person with a life and a family and that doesn't mean you have to sanitize it that just means you've just got to tell the truth which is what i've tried to do here so uh we're going to start going through some details i'll put in a little disclaimer here for pedants who are out there i'm a pedant so i'm happy with this uh, i did say in that earlier on that freddie mills uh, didn't have a criminal record. He had a tiny, tiny criminal record. I was going to put it in part one, but it, it it kind of became irrelevant. I didn't want to throw you off. So, oh, little train going past. Uh, so fr when Freddie was a small boy, uh, he was found guilty of stealing a set of roller, roller skates from an abandoned house. You can see why I haven't put this in the story. Uh, he went to court. He was, at that point, he was a little bit unruly. He hadn't discovered boxing uh, his family were fined one pound his mum was really upset about this his dad was really upset about this and his dad was like we need to get you some discipline got his got his boy into boxing it became the best thing in his life uh, his parents got him a job as milkman's assistant where as i said before he was trained by the brother uh, of uh, the uh, the welsh light heavyweight champion uh, and that's really where all his discipline started so freddie doesn't have really have a criminal record uh, he doesn't have an adult criminal record that's the only criminal record that i can find that he has um so I'm just saying that to you now, but I didn't put that in the episode because I, I, I didn't... You know what it, it's like sometimes if you, says, you say someone has a small criminal record, you go, oh, small criminal record, oh, it all starts there. But do you know what? If you've got a driving offence, if you caught for speeding, you've got a criminal record there, you know? Or, or well, probably not driving offence, but... So I'm going to I'm going to close this cupboard. Sorry, it came open by itself. And I just don't like, I don't, it's looking at me and I don't like it. Uh, so Freddy's Club, 
uh, the Freddie Mills night spot at 143 Charing Cross Road uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, in 2004, basically that big cross and Blackwell building, which is on the corner of uh, the end of Charing Cross Road and the corner of uh, basically the junction of Oxford Street, uh, New Oxford Street and Tottenham Court Road. It's basically, if you've been on my tour, it's literally by Tottenham Court Road tube station, where we stand, where we meet. That's literally where Freddie Mills night spot was. Uh, it got knocked down in 2004 so it's basically the Crosswell connection now uh, the Astoria nightclub was there so uh, locals will remember that for a while it was G-A-Y uh, before its demise before it got knocked down it was the Dionysus fish and chip shop mmm very nice yes uh, but it doesn't exist anymore unfortunately so I couldn't take you any p pictures I'm going to put some pictures online of what the front door was like and the kind of area before it was knocked down, but there's there's not a lot I can really show you. So I've I've put pictures online of Goslet Yard because I think that's that's important, and the crime scene photos from Gos Goslet Yard. Obviously, there's no photos of Freddie Mills and the rifle inside the car because the ambulance men removed Freddie and the gun uh, before the police turned up. So there's no photos of Freddie in situ, which I find quite interesting. Which means we have to base everything that we know on Freddie's position and the position of the gun based on the witness testimony, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, as I pointed out in here, obviously these are, these are people who are distressed, they're upset. So, you know, um, whether their memories are accurate or given the situation has to be uh, taken into account as well. Uh, as I've mentioned before, in quite a few cases, you have if you have 20 people, like the Brian Alexander Robinson episode, if you have 20 people staring at the same thing at the same time, you'll get 20 different stories or 20 different variations of a story, which which is fascinating. But it's people under pressure, do you know, and and your memory, your, your visual memory is selective as well. It's it's you don't see everything. You see what you want to see. You see what upsets you. It's all it's emotional based. So uh, so let, let's dive into some stuff. Uh, just a bit of background. Andy Ho, his business partner, uh, born 2nd of July 1913 in Singapore. His real name was Andrew Chin Guan Ho. Uh, he was an actor. That's uh, how he got to know Freddie Mills. Uh, he appeared in films like Swiss Family Robinson in the 1960s, uh, The Avengers in 1961, not the Marvel's Avengers, obviously, and British TV series It Ain't, it ain't, our, it ain't our Hot Mum. Uh, and he died in January 1992 in London. Uh, so I thought I'd throw that in. Downfall of the Nightclub. I didn't put this into the story, but uh, only because I couldn't really find hard evidence for it and i don't like putting in things that aren't unless i can find real proof that it should be there i, I just don't like putting in things that especially from the press journalists have a tendency to add in bullshit and not back it up and then as you'll notice sometimes they, they'll put in a story like it, especially in the tabloids they're putting a story saying um brad pitt was found in a toilet uh having sex with four midget wrestlers and that'll be front page story for three days. And then they'll, it'll go to court and they'll be told off. They'll have to pay him like £500 or something ridiculous. And then they'll have to print a retraction. And the retraction won't be on the front page. It'll be on page 17 in a tiny box about the size of a matchbox where they say, uh, sorry, you know, in this article, we did say that he was caught in the toilet with um, you know, midget wrestlers. Um, this was entirely untrue. That's what tabloid press do. They print any old shit and then they retract it later on when you've forgotten about it and they put a tiny little retraction on page 17. I th personally think if they defame anyone, they should use as much print space that they use to defame them as to be positive about them. Really, we should, we should be attacking shitty tabloid newspapers now and saying, if you're going to print crap like this without any proof... This is going to be your punishment. You need to spend a week saying what a nice person this is. And they won't sell any papers doing that because nobody likes positive stuff. Nobody likes that kind of stories. They like the negative stuff. But um, that's the power of, um, unfortunately, crappy journalism. So uh, just prior to the, the close 
of uh, just prior to Freddie's death and, and the downfall of the nightclub, there was an investigation by the Sunday People newspaper, <coughs> uh, who suggested that hostesses, inverted commas, worked in the basement room. Uh, obviously, hostesses is a bit of a euphemism for prostitutes. Um, definitely. Oh, now, around that time, uh, Freddie Mills and Andy Ho were fined. They say fifty pounds. It wasn't. It was sixty-eight pounds for serving alcohol. Um, now it had a liquor license, but the the licensing law was around that time was if you were going to have like alcohol, you had to have a proper meal with it. And apparently, they hadn't had a proper meal. So you can see that Freddie Mills isn't a gangster at all. He's not going against the rules. This is literally just a, t a slight tweak of the rules. They also had an illegal fruit machine on the premises. Uh, it is believed that it was actually Andy Ho who was responsible for this as Fred, as we said before Freddie Mills was really a figurehead but we will never really know that um but um obviously Andy knew him quite well um and had said that Freddie had been very depressed recently he got like a lot of financial worries and over the last two to three months before he died he'd become increasingly depressed uh about everything that was going on and the real sparkle had gone out of his eyes um I think oh just saw my tea I'm gonna have my tea again um, now I've very much put the um, it's mentioned in there but when Freddie was sitting alone in Goslett Yard thinking about killing himself there was a lot of indecision going on there so I referenced it but I thought I'd flag this up a little bit more um, now I mentioned in there that uh, he went to pick up the gun from Mary who worked at the fairground this is all all proven uh, we've had Mary's statement you know that's definitely where the gun came from he did actually return the gun back to mary saying oh no the the, the fate that i'm meant to be opening has been cancelled and then the next day he came back and went oh no no it's back on again so you can see a real indecision that on the tuesday he was definitely of a mind to go and kill himself when the thursday he picked up the gun friday he returned it then he got it back again so um there's a lot going on. And this was around the time, don't forget, Freddie was very ill at the time. He got pneumonia. He hadn't slept in a long time. So he's really struggling with that at the moment. But he definitely, he said to her, as he's left, he said, I'll return it on Sunday at 3 p 3 3 p.m. without fail. Obviously, he didn't because he knew he was going to kill himself. Well, he didn't really know he was going to kill himself. But he, uh, that night, he was flip-flacking between whether to kill himself or whether to not. Um, with the autopsy... It was performed by uh, Professor Keith Simpson, uh, who was the uh, after Sir Bernard Spilsbury. He was the uh, London. He was the chief pathologist. Uh, there was no exit wound um, in Freddie's head. The bullet had entirely disintegrated and remained inside his head. Um, Post mortem was carried out in Westminster mortuary, and particles of metal fragments were obtained from the skull and brain. Now, um, Pro Professor Simpson, Simpson, I can't say that. Keith, we'll call him Keith. Uh, <laughs> Keith said that the uh, the muzzle of the rifle would have either been in contact or near with the right eye. Uh, there was a three three to four millimeter entry hole. It directed through the head. The tra trajectory went right through the the bony sphenoid uh, of the of the base of the skull, uh, through the brain stem, and into into the cerebellum. And there was no exit wound. Exit wound. And uh, those pieces remained shattered inside his skull. Uh, and according to him, damage to the skull was irrevocable. There was blood in Freddie's throat, so suggesting that he was still breathing. Obviously, as we know, he was shot at some point prior to 11.45. And the ambulance was called, uh, what, well, arrived at 1.39. So he was alive throughout that point because they found him still technically alive so there's blood in his throat he was still breathing if you remember he had froth around his mouth and his nose as well so he was sitting upright his hands on his lap breathing you know probably trying to calm himself or just maybe not knowing what was going on who knew um so obviously he went into some kind of uh, paralysis or something like that uh, there were uh, no ab abnormalities no poisoning no disease uh, there was no evidence of foul play, according to the pathologist. Cause of death was firearm wound to the head. He had no bruises, no cuts. There were no signs of him being forced. No bruises on his wrists, his arms, his neck, which you would expect. If he, there were some people who said he was he was held down and then shot, but there's no evidence of that at all. Um, there was also uh, very little burning or, or uh, powder flash on his eyebrow, 
uh, sorry, on, on his eyelid. Uh, and the slug caliber, the caliber of the, the clinker was not powerful enough to exit through his head. Um, so, yeah, and he, even uh, Keith, the pathologist, Keith Simpson, uh, suggested uh, that owing the way the rifle was held, uh, the trigger must have been down by his knees. Um, there's there's people online who say it's just not possible to do it, and they've tried to prove it, but it it is very possible. It is really very possible. Um even the pathologist here said it is entirely possible. And you look you look at the gun itself, and it's 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 not massive. And don't forget, Freddie was a big man as well. He was a decent sized man, so he could definitely yeah, and he had good reach on his arms as well, so it's not really not a problem. Uh so the and it, Professor Keith said the gun was pointed at his forehead, uh, but as he pulled the trigger it may have slipped and he shot himself in the eye, which I think is entirely conceivable as well, because don't forget, you're holding the gun at an, at an irregular angle, so the muzzle is at your forehead and your finger is on the trigger, and you close your eyes, so as the weight is going down, let's say on your right hand, which is on the trigger, if if the muzzle of the gun isn't pressed right against your forehead, how do you know exactly whether it is pointed at your forehead or whether it's slipped down by maybe an inch? That's all it takes, an inch to your eye. So even the pathologist said it's entirely conceivable that he did try and shoot himself through the head. The bullet would have penetrated through his skull and entered his brain. It wouldn't have exited out the other side. Um, they proved it and they said it, it, it would go through bone, uh, but it wouldn't have gone a long way through. Um, Freddie had uh, clotted blood in his nostrils, as we saw, clotted br blood and uh, froth, uh, and, he, and he had bleeding inside his closed eyes. So uh, his eyes were open, but obviously they were closed after after he'd shot himself. Um, poor Freddie. Must must have been quite a quite, a, you know, to be to be taken that far in your life to have to have risen so high and then to get to a point where you think to yourself that you know you think to yourself I, I, i've got nothing left you know he's um better off dead and especially for such a such a champion like him someone who you know life was about success Maybe that's it. Maybe he couldn't. Maybe because he was always a fighter and he kept going and going and going. That's what I tried to get across in the story: is a man who kept going and going and going, and always like every time he got down, got knocked down, he'd get back up again and fight on. But you know, Freddie had nothing left. He had no money left. He was he was really ill. So um, yeah, poor Freddie. Uh, now, um, where did the kind of idea that? People start saying that uh, the police were uncertain whether it was a suicide or a murder. That's what they do. And every time you read any of these documentaries, people always go, oh, yeah, within the first couple of hours, the police were like, oh, is it a suicide or is it a murder? Oh, like that. OK, I'll, t I'll tell you exactly where it comes from. <sighs> and it happens in every single case and it has to happen. It's absolutely vital. So obviously the police turn up and you see a man with uh, a, a gun at his head and it looks like he's killed himself. looks like a suicide, but obviously the police have to make a decision whether it was suicide or murder, and then they have to vet investigate whether it was. This was clear-cut to the police. But in order to progress any further, uh, obviously we know that the uh, Freddy Citroen, his car was preserved for fingerprints, uh, and then sealed off the yard at 2.41 a.m., uh, that's when it was officially declared as sealed. Obviously, the police were standing pr there prior to that to that point, not letting people down. But that's when it was officially declared as sealed. Uh, fingerprints were taken at the scene at three fifty two a.m. Still a little bit dark. It wasn't dawn up. Obviously, they did a, a, a more thorough fingerprint examination after that. But at four a.m. Uh, the police had to start inquiring whether this was a suicide or a murder. Obviously, they were new to the scene because the pathologist, Keith, Keith, Keith Simpson, Keith, Keith Simpson, God, people, give me a name I can pronounce. Keith, uh, he needed to know which way it went, whether it was a murder or suicide, in order for him to progress. Because obviously, there are... Uh, ways of examining the body that are different so if it's a suicide or a murder obviously there are different things that he needs to look at but at that point the police said it's highly likely that it's a suicide 
so obviously that's why Keith looks into things like like um, um, he looks at all the things that would happen in the suicide but at the same time he checks Freddie's body for kind of bruises around his wrists or do you know, do you know duct tape things like that handcuffs and uh, and so he went through all of that and said right okay it's definitely not a murder it's a suicide I, c I can tell just by looking at the body and he did but that's what a lot of kind of bad journalists do is they look at this case and they go oh the police already within an hour they were saying oh but is it a murder is it a murder it's like no the police knew it was a suicide but they ha but they have to do everything methodically they have to do everything right they have to make sure that if they say it's a suicide that it is actually a suicide and not a murder so whew, another cup of tea right now i was going to put this in the story but uh, i wanted to uh i didn't want to uh bore the story by going into these theories obviously as you know, I think we did this with the uh, Ginger Ray episode that there was a lot of theories going out there. And we had that story about that lady, I think her name was Catherine, who said, I think Ginger Ray was killed by Freddie Piera. He was taken to uh, uh, Ginger Ray by a Chinaman called JT Foon. And you should arrest Johnny Piera because he is a black man. Do you know, you, you probably remember that from episode eight or nine. Um we've got loads of these here so i'm going to go through them very quickly uh so 29th of april 1940 mrs irene n cox of of brighton in sussex who claims to be a spiritual healer and medium you can switch off now if you want to <laughs> sent a letter to sir john waldron who was the ch chief commissioner of police i won't, i'm not going to read the whole letter but she, she says i am a spiritual he healer and medium and a few days ago i started to think about freddie mills and suddenly and suddenly felt he had been murdered not having commi committed suicide as with, as with the decision of the coroner um uh, da, 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 da. um i want you to ask the pathologist had he considered if freddie mills had had been the victim of an indian or other nationality individual having killed him by a karate chop <gasps> i.e being struck very sharply and cleverly on the back of the neck then shooting him to make it look like a suicide <sighs> she's amazing even though he was do you know there was no evidence of a of a karate chop to the back of the neck but obviously when you read all of these letters that are in there the the freddie's file is full of it the police unfortunately have to take these kind of nut jobs seriously and they get a lot of them and then people go why did the police not investigate this and the problem is you, if the police get a hundred people approach them with different theories some of them sensible some of them wacky they have to take all of them seriously because the problem is what happens if down the line uh, theory 100 which is the wackiest turns out to have an element of truth in it so the police have to sit there and they have to take these very carefully and just loads of these nut jobs out there there's another one okay so well, 15th of december 1970 you know, you notice in a pattern that they all seem to happen around the same time. That's because uh, newspaper articles came out going, who who murdered Freddie Mills? Mm -hmm. um, so Thomas Anthony Deans, who was a 32-year-old labourer uh, in of Black Mountain Grove in Belfast, uh, made a statement to the Royal Ulster Constabulary, uh, so he's not even in the right country to start off with, uh, stating that he was he was present when a man named Jumbo shot Freddie Mills. Dean served time for possession of a firearm and ammunition, and whilst attending court, he was heard to shout that he had... Uh, let's ignore that bit. Uh, where was the important bit? Yeah, no. So, uh, um... He claims that he knows that he knows the Cray twins, which he didn't. Claimed to be he was a bit habitual criminal. He said that Ronnie Cray had killed him, and that, um... And that he had heard that from Ronnie Cray when he was in Parkhurst, which is all bollocks. Another one, 5th of January 1941, Mar Maria, Maria Celine Mulally. Ooh, what kind of a name is that? Mulally. Mulally. <laughs> um, uh, what's this one? Uh, da, 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 da. She's another one who claims that it was the Cray twins who helped murdered, uh, murdered Freddie Mills uh, owing to a homosexual relationship which obviously we all know we've already gone through that 
Ronnie Cray himself said that Freddie wasn't a homosexual or bisexual and that he wasn't having a relationship with um, uh, Michael Halliday. Uh, where's this one? There's another one. There's a huge one here that I found in there. The huge letter. It's actually at the top of the file by a guy called Alfred Peter Neal, who was a former journalist, inverted commas, uh, who lived in Balham. And a lot of these stories seem to come from him. And the, uh, so he claimed that he was close friends with Freddie Mills. There's no evidence for that at all. And he was a close friend with Michael Halliday, the singer who was meant to be the, the homosexual lover of, of Freddie Mills. Um, he knew that he said he knew that Freddie was a bisexual too. That it was it was talk around town, all that. His letters are really, really vague, totally vague, and he states that Freddie Mills had two bullet holes in him, and he insisted that the body is exhumed to prove it. There was only one bullet hole and no exit wound, um, and that he claims that a friend of his said that the chief inspector had said that uh, Freddie Mills was definitely the murderer of those prostitutes in West London, which is all complete bullshit. Where's this important bit? I should have marked it up. Um, when he, when he, uh, the, he made all these claims, he went to the police and when the police sat him down and said, right, where's your evidence? He went, oh, oh I, I don't have any evidence, but I'm, I'm going to the Sunday Express and the Mirror and he's planning to write a book about it. So uh, if you see a book out there by Alfred Peter Neal, who claims to be a former journalist, bollocks to him, full of shit. But there's loads of them. I've got loads of them literally sitting here. There's another guy who, he, who was in Johannesburg and claimed that he was with a guy who claimed that he killed Freddie Mills. Is this his final? Where's his final one? Oh, yeah, here's my favourite one. OK, this is the one I was leading up to. So 20th of October, 1980, Amy Verdun Fellows. A uh, 62-year-old lady living in Birmingham. She entered New Scotland Yard claiming that Freddie Mills had been murdered. She claimed that she was present at the time of the shooting. She was in a vehicle with a friend called Danny, no surname given, in a side street off Tottenham Court Road. Wrong street, but never mind. Um, at nine o'clock in the evening, wrong time in the evening, sometime in October 1958, wrong month and year... When she saw a male shooting Freddie Mills in the temple, wrong part of the body, with a revolver, wrong weapon, while sitting in the front seat, wrong seat, of Freddie's own vehicle. <laughs> the mysterious shooter then gave Danny the silencer. Uh, uh, she didn't know uh, what went on, but learned of the death of Freddie Mills that evening, which weirdly was seven years before he even died. Uh, and she states that Danny was part of a gang of protection mobsters who worked for Billy Hill, who was like the the, the uh, criminal kingpin in the West End. Uh, and she names other people as well. Luckily, in the police statement, they say uh, police state that she was irrational and rambling. Uh, interestingly, all of these people went to the press and the press, because they have nothing better to write about, um, they take these people's stories and they go, oh, we've heard, blah, 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 and it's all bollocks. This is what annoys me about newspapers is it's not the truth. This is why I keep saying to people, if you're going to write a story, a true crime story, don't use newspapers. It's bollocks. Use newspapers if you're going to attack it and say, this is what the press said, but at least have the decency to say this is what the press said, but don't trust this is true, and I'm I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not saying that the press is all entirely lies. They do a great job, but the problem is, you get some journalists out there. Same with everyone else. Same with other authors or TV makers or whatever. You get some people out there who are just not very good at their job. Same with every industry. And the problem is, you how do you know who the good people are and the bad people are? There are some great journalists out there, and, and when I see their name, I go oh, thank God for that. Like so, I, I do use newspapers sometimes, but I carefully check which newspaper it is and which writer it is because if i can get the right writer with the right newspaper i know okay they i know that they've done their research well there was a writer for the Ab normally the Ab is the aberdeen argus normally they have normally their details are normally very good i've kind of go through their newspapers and go oh okay but they, they had one journalist a while ago who was so shit really he he said Dennis Nielsen, obviously you know I know a lot about Dennis Nielsen, and he opened with a paragraph was, uh, Dennis Nielsen sat on the shoreline of Fraserburgh where he grew up, ripping the wings off seagulls. Okay? 
never happened. I've even sent them a letter saying, OK, I need you to show me where this proof is, because I think you're talking complete shit. Because if you look at Dennis Nielsen's history, man loved animals. Have a listen to my episodes uh, 10, 11 and 12, I think. Um, Dennis loved animals. He absolutely adored animals. There's no way he would rip wings off a seagull. And if so, how did they get that piece of information? Oh, I'm on a rant. Sorry about that. Right. Okie dokie. Um, one thing I didn't put into the story, which I, which is important, but I couldn't find an in, a, a good way to put in because it's kind of it's it's future project, projection. Uh, but it's about depression and boxers. So obviously, Freddie Mills was a product of the 1940s and 1950s, and that was kind of an era where men didn't talk about their feelings. They didn't talk. They they weren't emotional. Even a lovely guy like Freddie Mills, lovely guy, went out of his way to help his friends with mental illnesses, was really lovely. Have a look at pictures. I'll, put, I'll post some pictures online. Freddie Mills, you just, you just instantly fall in love with him because he's a lovely man. And he clearly had a big heart. But as I mentioned in here, he trained as a boxer. Boxers are meant to not show their, their, uh, um, uh, their weaknesses. That's part of their training. And it, it figures through into their lives as well. And all boxers agree that boxing is a really lonely sport. You know, you're by yourself in the gym basically all the time. And you have lots of people telling you what to do, but you don't really, you know. A, a lot of boxers have a, re have a real problem because it is, is lonely. And it's only in the last couple of years, if you look very carefully, I think as... As men, we're quite we're we're quite useless at you know talking about the fact that we have problems, which is why I'm happy to do this with Murder Mild. You know, I've been through depression myself, and I'm happy to talk about it in uh, Murder Mild and Extra Mild. But it's only now, if you look, that actually boxers are starting to come forward and saying, you know, we do have problems and we need help. So, for example, here's some big names that I'll just throw out there of some of some recent champion boxers who are only just coming out recently and saying that they battle with depression and anxiety and they are of course uh all been stated so i'm not outing anyone uh ricky hatton tyson fury frank bruno frank bruno uh kel brook and mike tyson so the, these are all fantastic boxers world champions who are all all struggled with uh, depression over the years. So I didn't put that into the story, but it's worth really flagging it up that don't forget, Freddie was of a different generation, and he was and and like if you look at his story as well, like he had fin massive financial troubles, but he didn't tell his wife about it. His wife only learned about it a couple of days before when it was opened up at court. So you can tell that he really loved her, but he hid a lot from her. Do you know he hid a lot about his feelings about his finances. So. Um, so yeah, so I, I hope you enjoyed that. That took a long time to uh, research the Freddie Mills case because uh, there's a lot of rubbish out there. And it was what I really wanted to do was to rip apart all of that crap and just get down to the truth of who Freddie Mills was. And literally, the key pieces of information were right there in in the police records, right there. That that all of these so-called people who write novels and and uh, documentaries and stuff like that just they'd entirely forgotten or they just they just glossed over it and that's the, that's what i say every week is that it's these small details that you have to focus on not going to wikipedia and going what does wikipedia say or picking up someone's crappy book because if you read someone's book about a case you're going to get their perspective this is why i go back to the original source because the police files the court files it's it's not perspective at all. It's literally, it's just series of facts. And even though a series of facts will contain stuff like other people's theories in there, or like the, the crappy letters that we've just heard about from the from the mad people who say that who say that Freddie was shot seven years before he was killed, which is baffling. Um, it's all still in there, but it, at least that gives you the opportunity to read through it. Like with the the fir the very first thing in the file when I opened it up was that uh what was his name? Uh Alfred Peter Neal, the former journalist. And it's it's loads of letters by him and it's just it's 
I read afterwards, I started reading up about Alfred Peter Neal, and there was a lot of other journalists who said, yeah, yeah, he's a respected journalist, and he believes this, and he believes that, blah, 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 blah. And when you read their documents, you go, oh, God, yeah, it could be true. But when I started reading uh, Alfred Peter Neal's original letters that he sent to the police about the fact that Freddie Mills was the Hammersmith stripper and that he was a homosexual and that he was involved. I mean, he, he made all of these claims, every single claim that I've stated in here. He made all of them. And that's what a lot of these crappy journalists out there, the tabloid hacks, are using as the basis of their story. But when you read Alfred Peter Neal's original documents, the original letters he sent to the police, you read them and you go, this man is insane. This man is deranged. It's like not clear sentences. He's all over the shop. And you read it and you just go, holy crap. This is where people get their facts from. So so in, in newspapers, when they go, a source, a source close to Freddie Mills said, Alfred Peter Neal could be the source. There's also another uh, um, uh, book out there. I've mentioned him in the, the Michael Litchfield book where he claims that Freddie Mills is the uh, the Hammersmith stripper. Even though I disagreed with the uh, the BBC documentary that's out there, I'll put a link to it. It's called Murder in Soho, The Death of Freddie Mills. They do interview uh, Michael Litchfield about his book, inverted commas. Um, and the one thing I think they did get right was they did sit him down and say, OK, so how, how much of this is true? And they kind of hammered it through him. And he went, oh, oh I reckon it's about 80 percent right. It's 80 percent piss off. 80 percent, 8 percent right at best. But uh, he's the one who said he has this confession where Freddie Mills says um, uh, that he was the Hammersmith stripper. Yeah. Where's that confession? Bring it out. Let us all hear it and then we can walk away or stop pissing off the family. Don't forget, these are grieving relatives who are sitting here and it's their dad that we're talking about. Their dad and their and their husband. How would he feel if we turned around to his wife or anyone and said, do you know, do you know your, your husband? Yeah, I think he's I think he's probably a serial sexual sadist. I caught a, we'll, we'll just invent stories and we'll say I caught him masturbating in front of a school. See how he likes that. We'll say, oh, yeah, I've got a confession which says he definitely did that. That's what I hate is people who do this just to make a name for themselves. If you're going to tell a story, tell it true. Be honest about it. Stop creating lies. Oh, so infuriating. <sighs> Rest. I'm going to go and have my cake now. I think I've earned one. Um, so that was the Freddie Mills episode. Hope you enjoyed that. Sorry, there's a lot of facts at the end of that. Um, I am now going to start p writing part one of the big multi-parter. I've mm. been researching this for a long time. Uh, and it's... I'm not going to tell you who it is. Oh, I'm going to try not to tell you who it is. It's, it's uh, a relatively famous one. Um, but because I sat down and went through the original files... So I'm not using anyone else's books because everyone else's books, as I, as I said before, do you know, it's full of bias. And also they, they don't look at the angles that I want. Do you know, they, 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 they pick one side of it, but they don't look at the little details that I really love. Do you know, like I've said before, where, do you know, y you learn about a person's life by learning, by picking up those tiny little details. And it's the tiny details that I love that builds a big picture about a person's life. So um, it's a relatively famous case. But I've read, I've done it in my own particular way. So even if you know about the case, you'll come along here and you go, oh, I didn't know that because I didn't know that as well. And I've got so many. Oh, God, it literally was. It was three or four thousand pages of documents. And I had to read them like two or three times to get to because sometimes something would be re referenced. And I'd have to go back to the I'd go. Oh, oh, where was it in the old document? I think it was in file 42. And I go, oh, my God, where is it? Uh but it's very exciting. I found a different angle on a case that I think we all thought that we knew, but really we didn't. So, um, yeah, that's going to be quite exciting. So um, that's Extra Mile for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week with... No, I'm not going to tell you. So uh, <laughs> join us next week to find out who the big multi-parter is. Until then, lots of love. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.